what is active engagement? Active versus passive learning. All right, active learning is when students are required to do things, practice using new knowledge, and that way they can really develop skills. Our job as faculty in these situations is to facilitate. So, and all of us I know do things like this, presentations, um, uh, well-led discussion, participation, role play, in-depth examinations of case studies, debates. These are situations where students have to actively use information that they've been working with and um, learn new skills. Sort of the opposite would be listening to a lecture or reading a textbook, looking at charts, watching a video or a demonstration. Those are learning activities, but they are passive learning as opposed to the students actually engaged with the material and having to do something themselves. One thing I would say about the active learning versus passive learning um, is I think that our students have strong preferences here. And their preferences may not be what is best for their learning. Um, I think a lot of students, especially like kind of like early on in the pandemic, really focused on getting a lecture from their instructor. I want to hear my instructor. I want to hear what they're talking about. If I don't get the full 50 minutes that I that I, that I deserve, then I might I feel like I'm not getting enough. Um, and we heard that some early on. There was there was some internal communication around that within within our college about what is it what does it mean to be in college and what does it mean um, to be teaching a class. Um, and active learning shifts responsibility onto the student because the student needs to do something to be part of this learning process and it's a lot easier to sit back and it's a lot easier to say that it's the teacher's job to do something to me to the teacher must make me learn than it is to be a partner in that learning with a specific role with a way to get through it. Um, and I think we see that in, in online meetings sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to be the first person to unmute your mic um, and talk or be the first person to share, you know, what they've done in the past. Um, so, I mean, we, on this last slide, we gave the strategy of KWL. What do I know? What do I want to know? What do we learn? And um, we asked the question, um, what are you doing already? And I can see we got a lot of different disciplines in here. So I would bet money <laughs> that Janet Nepke as a music teacher <laughs> has a lot of active practice in her lessons. And I would bet as a chemistry instructor, Antoine has a lot of students do sections in their learning. And what I find is, you know, our disciplines all have things and strategies that we do um, very naturally because that's the way it's always been taught. But what, what can be really helpful is when we talk about what we do with each other, because what's typical in a business classroom is so different what's typical in a psychology classroom, yet at the same time, the, the strategies that they always, that they are traditional in their disciplines, sometimes work really well um, across. So in a business classroom, I mean, business classrooms have always done case studies. That has always been a traditional business classroom teaching methodology to use case studies in other disciplines is sometimes seen to be different or innovative, but we can learn a lot from what they already did. So with that like emotional plea to please, you know, not make this into a passive um, experience, um, what is something in your discipline that you do as part of your practice that makes the students do something or makes the students be active in their learning when they're with you?
Go ahead. Please, yes. Okay, so uh, as you bet, yeah, you're right. We do a lot of um, laboratory um, experiment, but um, for a reason or another, I find it now, I, 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 especially through the pandemic where we didn't have access to the lab and it was all analysis on data analysis on computer, but I realize and it applies to the lab because in the mind of a student, so what I'm realizing is if a student has to do a problem set, um, a quiz or a lab, and it's part of official learning experience, they don't care. They don't engage in it because for them it's it's weird. It's, 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 it's not fun, it's not an activity, it's just part of what they have to do. Uh, same as if they have to drive to school or it's just part of the process and they're just thinking about their marks. They need a marks and they need a credit and if you know and that's what they think about and it's business as usual. But I'm not convinced that they engage fully in it. It's kind of um, going shopping for the grocery stores and not being there but buying what you need for supper but you're not there. You're just doing it mechanically. So that's what I find when they go in the lab, you will think they will learn, they will engage with the, the theory and apply it. But no, it's like they're doing shopping. They're just, yeah, buying a chocolate bar or whatever they need and they leave. And uh, so that's why I'm interested in, 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 in this presentation today, because even if I, we do quizzes, it's the same. They, I can tell that it's, it's, it's a part of their brain where they read because they don't know how to read. And then they wait for me to give the answer. And if I help them, guide them to find a way, a methodology to get the answer, then they block. It's kind of, no, no, that's not part of the game. Or, you know, they, I'm going to engage 10% in that exercise. And if it requires 90% nine, uh, extra, I'm not going to do it. It's already planned in their head. It's, it's, so that's kind of, I'm looking for helping them to convince that they're not actually when you do a lab it's it's for your learning and and i have a hard time to change that mindset that's for example those are examples where we do active learning but i'm not convinced so maybe it's the definition of active learning but i'm not convinced they're engaging in it mm -hmm. so, so i think i hear two things in there and and they might be two separate things or two related things correct me if i'm wrong i think i'm hearing in there that Sometimes the students are doing activities, but they aren't like doing that deep engagement with the activity to connect it to what was like in the textbook. They might, they might under, you know, understand I have to put in this much of, you know, vinegar for titration, but they don't think about what does titration really mean? Is that, yes. is that what you're saying? Yeah, that, that definitely that's part of it. Yeah. And then the second thing I thought I heard you say is that you feel like our students have become so grade motivated that if it is not something that is, this is worth X number of points on your final grade, it's difficult to get them to buy in to an activity. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. And also, also what I meant is, um, this, it's they come in class as um, an automatic pilot. You see what I mean? It's 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 going to class, going to school. They've done it since they're kid. So they learn how to disengage half their brain mm -hmm. to think about something else, but still being there to mechanically do what they asked to do. So mm -hmm. it's to break that routine to 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 make them realize, no, actually, you know, you're you privileged to take to not being at McDonald's flipping bar burger and right now being here to learn. And, and, and it's up to you to engage in the learning and take it as a, as a reality. It's not just uh, since uh, uh, kindergarten, you know, you go in class and it's mechanical. I don't know. It's like change the, it's real. You know, it's, it's an opportunity to learn. And like you say, and connect everything together. But it's to break, break this. Yeah, I'm waking up. I go to class or I go to the lab. I do whatever mm -hmm. I have, but I see robots. Because that's what they've done since they're kid. It's part of the cultural their life like contrary to if you think about someone that stopped school went on the job market then worked for a while and come back to school they come back completely different because they broke that school routine routine and they realize oh actually life is real 
yeah, you, you're alive. It's real. It's not a joke. It's not, you're not part of a game or a software. This, this, this is real. And, you know, you need to engage and because there's consequence from your non-engagement or, you know, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm realizing recently. And I think through the pandemic and the online, it was just right in my face how much that was true. And I could reapply it even when it was not non uh, face to face previous COVID, I realized, yeah, you know, it's, it didn't appear from online. So when they're going to come back, it's going to be very interesting because they're going to be one year or a year and a half on this automatic pilot that has been even more automatized by being on the screen. So we're going to have to break that routine that, you know, like go back in the real world. <laughs> Jay, I don't know if it makes sense. But I'm, I'm... No, I, 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 I hear a lot of what you're saying there. Um, it's there are I think about this a lot. Our reentry into what we consider normal is going to take quite a bit of work. Um, and 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 we thought about that as we constructed um, this week. You know, there's they were saying some things like um, Rhea's leading a panel, a couple panels. We have a couple times we're doing the same thing. What do I want to take with me from the pandemic? What worked well that I'm going to try to incorporate back into my into my teaching? And um, what other things do we have to kind of reintroduce and renorm and bring in? Yeah, I'll be doing a workshop on a motivational syllabus, really trying to take in, into consideration where we're all coming from that we don't even know where our students are, how do we invite them in, welcome them in and say, These, this is what we're doing together. You know, the mm -hmm. idea of collaboration, of creating a learning space, of kind of changing their expectations. I know for myself, I do, particularly in my freshman classes, I talk about, we, we start the class with what's, what's learning? How do you define learning? How do you define teaching? What's what's your responsibility what's mine how do we do this together and supposed to making assumptions and you're right most of them are like well you give me the information and then i know it and i'm like actually in my field you kind of gotta practice it so i set up situations so that you get a chance to practice it and then you get a chance to find out what's working for you and what's not and then we can go from there so but really defining things from the beginning and right now like ed said this is going to be a big deal this fall, this is a major transition back <laughs> to a new place, which is kind of weird. So yeah, having that conversation is is part of it, sort of priming the pump. I'm gonna go yes. back. Hands up. Yep. Yeah. I'm go back to the shared, unless you all prefer faces. Should we stay with faces? Let's stay with faces. Yeah, let's stay with faces. Okay. Ed, did you call in me? I couldn't tell. Yeah, because your hand was up. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to say a really great idea I heard at a PAC meeting recently, which is that John Cain um, share, allows faculty to sit in his semester. You know, with what we've been doing here, um, I've heard some really great teaching tips from faculty, but um, they were often hard for me to operationalize because although the idea made a lot of sense to me, I didn't see the person doing it. But we have on our campus, I'm just guessing, we probably have 10 or 20 people that are actually good at online instruction. And, you know, like if I could sit in on Chilton's class all semester, I would do that. And a couple of the other people whose names I forget, but whom I've watched all for years. I'm wondering, you know, John said it was hard to start that program because people had suspicions. What are they really doing? Are they going to be criticizing my teaching and all of that? But once they got over that, John is one of the persons whose classes I watch. I would love to watch a comfortably uh, a comfortable online teacher teaching. I'm, you know, Chilton comes to mind because he's talked about some of his teaching, but also the woman from whom I stole the idea of mini quizzes. I forget who that was. Is it Sarah Portway? Yeah. I would love to sit in on her class. I'm wondering if we could think about 
doing that for whoever is still teaching online. I would just sit there. I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't take the test. Just watch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could mm -hmm. we, could, could you maybe think about checking that out or asking well, John, Ed, you can ask John how he handles it. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. I'd be happy to talk with John and Ed and I can do this. The other thing that has come up in a couple of different is just having faculty visit each other's classes so that, you know what I mean? Because somebody can pick up something from you and it's sort of a nice exchange. So that you, you stop into their class sometimes, they can stop into your class and you then you have a, a shared experience to, to, to talk about and compare and suggest. I agree, Ria, but John teaches economics. He has 400 students. And he's learning. He's using learning analytics and a lot of online stuff. I would just love to watch. You know, like first day, for example, Chilton has a lot of icebreakers. First day, and then I only know this because he's mentioned it sort of halfway through when he's talking about it. So, yeah, I'd love to watch the development of the class semester long too. And sharing classrooms is a good idea too, of course. But watching how it works over the semester that would be cool. I Thank think you. the hardest thing to do with something like that, Janet, is the trust. The trust of the faculty members. Right. And so there would have to be some kind of community building before and after that made it say, it's okay to come in and see my class and talk about it and to make the person who's kind of opening themselves up to, I, you know, I, 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 the word that comes to my mind is feel safe. And I don't know if that's the right um, word, but it, it, it I think it is actually. I agree, but I think someone like Chilton and something like someone like Sarah, they already feel safe with good reason. They're great. Mm -hmm. But obviously the faculty member would have to volunteer. Sure. I agree. You know, it when does... we were talking about doing this, um, doing this session, we started from a uh, PDF. We started from a... Um, document that got shared around the pod listserv that that is a professional development group nationwide they have a very active listserv and they just said here are some concrete ways that we can or here's some concrete things that you could try in your class um to get you started and a lot of them are you know active learning some of them are technology related some of them are not technology related at all. Um, and I was wondering if we could look at a couple of these and find things that are already things that we do and make a note of that, but also make note of the things that um, are outside of our comfort zone just a little bit. Um, so, for example, if I'm just starting to look at this um, and I'm on page two, which is um, engagement strategies for the beginning, middle and end of class. Um, when I was in high school, when I was teaching high school, I was a polling guy. I was one of those people that would constantly put up multiple choice questions um, and be doing questions like that, walking them through the class like a clicker kind of thing. That was well within my um, wheelhouse. Um, but I always felt a little bit uncomfortable in brainstorming sessions. It was outside of my comfort zone. It wasn't, that wasn't like my teaching style. So it was always a stretch for me to invite people to do some unstructured brainstorming. Um, so that's my share. Is there anything, can, can, can anyone else like look at the list and say, you know, maybe something that they do and something that they maybe is out of their comfort zone a little bit? Want me to share this uh, document on my screen? Would that be helpful? Sure. So um, Ed was talking about page two. Here we are on page two. Here's page one. I did pop this into the chat. Tell me if you can't access it. I think you're all right. Um, so polling, one minute paper or application cards, brainstorming, 
that's interesting because I've done, I do the brainstorming more easily. Maybe it's because in the visual arts, we're used to throwing things out that are pretty crazy. Like it's almost fun to see how crazy you can make an idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I have done more of that um, in person even rather than, than online. And um, so that's really comfortable to me. And strangely enough, mind mapping I need practice with mm -hmm. definitely online. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know. I haven't done a lot of that. That would be kind of weird as a group to get folks to add things and say, no, I want to connect this to this. And that makes me think of that. And, oh, well, that makes me think of this. It's like brainstorming, but you're trying to get a visual out of it. And I, I haven't ever done that. Mm -hmm. So here, I with, with that in mind, Rhea, what makes a good brainstorming open question. How can you tell when a brainstorming activity is going to work well? That's a really good question. Because um, you, you said that's one of the things that's kind of like in your wheelhouse. So like, how do you know? Well, I haven't always used it that way. What I've done is we're talking about in progress work because I teach studio art. Mm -hmm. And we've got an etching that started. We've pulled first proofs. And so I often ask, all right, so this is where Jacqueline is with this. She's struggling. She's not comfortable with this and this parts of it, but she likes that. If this were yours, what would you play with? And why would you play with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it takes the pressure off anybody saying you should do this. It allows some of Now, if this were mine, okay, I would make his head bigger so that it was really out of proportion and it was really clear it was a focal point and his like eyes were really wild and because I like, think your title, you know, supports this or something. And it allows people to just sort of talk like if this were mine. So for me, a brainstorming question that allows things is, is it's not telling anyone what to do. It's, it's, it's uh, taking it on yourself and just saying, this is what I think and feel, and I'm not expecting anyone else to take responsibility. Okay, I like that. So what I think I hear you saying is it's not as wide open as I think of brainstorming to be. You've given them a set, you've given them almost a worked example, and then you say, what would you do different? And so then that lets them be very descriptive in what they would change and that might be what makes your brainstorming work a little bit better. Because I've got that structure. Because you've got structure set around it where, to me, brainstorming sounds like, okay, we're throwing out everything. And maybe that's <laughs> not why I'm not a good brainstormer. <laughs> so I was looking at the two things on this one. Rhea, if you scroll up a little bit, they have two strategies that to me look very similar, but they're not always We've got polling up on page two, and then on page three, they have traveling heads and pair teaching, peer instruction and traveling heads. And in their example here, both start with a multiple choice question. Hmm. So they start with polling. Students respond privately to a multiple choice question via a polling tool. And so this might be a good one for Antoine, who was saying, you know what? Active learning is okay, but I have a hard time getting my students to really think deeply about the polling question. So what's the difference between a poll question and a peer instruction traveling heads poll question? And to me, because I remember this used to be my wheelhouse. I used to do, I used to be doing clickers all the time. I used to put really easy questions on the polling and I would do those as confidence builders. You should already know this. Here's an easy question. We would fly through the easy questions real quick. You know, one every 20 seconds. Here's a question, vocab word, basic definition. But I would try to put on there some real humdingers. If, it, if I was making an analogy to math, what I would mean by that is it's like a two-step problem. 
you have to figure out something first so you can figure out the second thing. Um, Kristen had a good one on one of her tests. Um, they gave a percentage. Uh, I, I won't give that example because it, it, it's not my example. Um, so in this two-step two problem, you have to understand some basic knowledge and you also have to apply that knowledge. It may be an imagination question. If this happens, then what would you expect to happen? That's a much harder question. And that's a question that many of the students would probably get wrong on their first attempt. So in the traveling heads method, you give that tough question and then you say to your students, ooh, only a quarter of you got that question right. Why don't you talk to each other and figure out why there's a correct answer up here? So they both have to figure out the answer and figure out why it's the correct answer. And you give them two minutes to talk to each other and figure out the correct answer. And then you put it back up on the board, the same question a second time, and you see if they were able to figure it out together. And then you, I mean, th this has to be a really good question because you're going to spend five minutes on it, right? You got, it's got to be, be really good because then you're going to be getting a, okay, it looks like we're up to 80% now. Who can tell us what this group figured out? What did your group figure out that helped get you to the right answer. Because that first one, a good question to do this, has to be so hard that very few people got it right. If everybody gets it right, if 80% gets it right on the first attempt, it's not that type of question. Move on, right? <laughs> it's got to be something that's tough that they can figure out together. And then it's, it's, it, it, then that's a question that's worth talking about, you know? And that's a real challenge, I think, because you can't make it so hard that they can never figure it out. They can't make it so obscure that even working together, they can't figure out. It's got to be something that they can figure out together. And this will be different for different level courses. Of course, yeah. You know, and being aware sort of what slot you're in. Is this 100, 200, 300? What can you, um, what can you depend on most of them knowing where's that challenge point. I think that takes a lot of skill as the instructor. You've got to be able to visualize yourself exactly where the breakdown is going to happen. I know students will make this exact mistake, and those are the kind of like uh, things that you learn only through the hard knocks of teaching a course several times. But once you start to get those and you you are able to anticipate the student problems, those are the perfect, you know, traveling heads uh, questions because you say, I know you're going to make this mistake. This is the mistake you're going to make right here. So let's 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 talk about why this is a mistake. Let's all make the mistake together right here so that we don't make it the next time we see that. And that's that that's something that is. Um, that's what really great teachers do. Um, anybody else see anything on this list? Oops. Sorry. Is this the correct one? Yes, hallelujah. Yeah. I think reflection's a really important part, and that, um, comes back to really creating a situation and a classroom where people feel comfortable. Um, first of all, reflecting actively. So those require those good questions that Ed was just mentioning, but also 
um, sharing what they don't know so that they can, as a group, figure out, figure it out together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think reflection is is really key. And that's where sometimes pre and post questioning, you know, you come into a classroom and just ask some questions that they probably would remember if they'd done the reading or whatever prep work was required. And then at the end, you know, give me an understanding, you know, a quick, you know, that two minute exit strategy. So what did you get? What did you, what do you know that you're more confident with now that you weren't when you, when you came in or when you logged on? So those sorts of like, and if it, it's a matter of establishing, you know, habits and comfortable, you know, situation where people can say, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I just, I didn't make any sense to me. I'm, I'm lost there where somebody else can then hopefully pipe in and say, ah, at first it was for me too, but now this is what made the difference for me. I feel like reflection is the type of thing that can be um, really effective especially when you're letting your students diverge a little bit. When you start to give your students some voice and choice about how they're going to complete an assignment, or maybe they're doing different things, um, or it doesn't seem to be like that different, but like when you've let your students, you know, uh, everybody's going to do, you know, an assignment but you have a choice of some videos or you have a choice of finding your own you know activity or i'm thinking to my own educational career um you know when i was getting teacher certified you know we had assignments that were like go observe a class well the faculty member you know the faculty member that i was working with didn't know what kind of class i was ending up in didn't know what kind of teaching methods they did. So they had to rely on me to be observant, to be critical, and to look at that and have have a reflection on what I saw there. And so reflection was, you know, one of the one of the best ways to help assess that and keep me engaged in that active in, in, in actively into those sessions where it would have been really easy for me to fall back and be passive. So yeah, that giving people choices and then asking them to reflect on what their experience was, what they would do differently if they had a different option, what they figured out um, mm -hmm. by making those choices and hearing each other's perspective when they've chosen different things can be really, really valuable. Absolutely. Could you imagine doing the escape room tactic in one of your classes? Hold and on. Look at, I'll read it out loud just in case anybody doesn't have it up right now. The escape room says create a series of problems that students must solve to escape class. Um, use physical objects or images in the classroom environment. Could you imagine that? Wait, wait, where are you? It's further down. Hold on. I'm on page 10. OK, thank you. I could see how that could be really motivating. Like when you when you figure this <laughs> out. <you leave. laughs> but I don't know, I, I it, that doesn't fit into my normal teaching persona. Antoine, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, so um. So, so I, I, I see those are a great example, but um, what I'm struggle with is um, um, maybe it's because I'm really, I'm new in the trade of teaching is to be able, so there's so much material they need to learn in a semester. Like I'm sure you all in the same situation. And of course it's kind of my responsibility to say, okay, this is important. They need to learn that, or oh, that's details, maybe not that important and choose. But each time I use those activity, um, so they learn about a certain topic, but that takes time and takes away other topics they should learn. So it's, it's being able to find the balance between those activity and the topic they learn. And then if in addition as them, uh, you know, of course, I'm not I'm not going to tell them that way, but what I 
What I mean is, it's your response, you know, what I teach in lecture, that is not enough. There's more information you lean, need to learn about in a book or, you know, use office hour or other, other time if you need help. But if you think that just the lecture is enough to pass the core, it should not be that way because in a lecture, I'm giving you just to see your way through that big forest. But then I, often I get outcry, like they, they're losing it. They say, no, 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 that's not fair, you know. Uh, it's too much material. Uh, I, we just we should the material at the exam should just be what we see in class, and it's 50 minutes because after that I need to learn it, and then if there's more than we see in class, so that that's where I'm struggling. And then they're gonna complain. Well, you know, we're not gonna do those activities. They use less. Just give us the material in class we need to know for the exam. So so, so that's where I'm to convince them because again if if I don't convince them that no actually those activities are fun and good for you to learn they're going to block they're going to be there and they're going to be robot doing it because the instructor asked them to do it and they might get the right answer but they're going to forget you know this they this they forget everything after so if a student comes at you oh yeah I took that course last year or last semester but I forgot everything because me I'm teaching all uh, ele um uh, senior and junior so they supposedly they have the background but they always come at me and say no we forgot all that so what tells me is that okay for two or three years you've been a robot you've yeah. been in an automatic pilot you yeah and we're no not there in the class and i ask them have you done quizzes yes we did quizzes have you done those active learning yes we did it but they're still on this this is this mental block i'm trying to to break like you see what i mean so if I start to add, uh, I think those activities are great, but if I start to put them in class, then they're going to be stressed because they're going to say, oh, that takes me time from that. That means that now I'm going to have on my own go in the book to learn whatever we didn't have time to learn in class. And so how do you go about it like to 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 find that balance and to bring students with you in that balance? So I'm going to answer your question for me. Because this is like the age old teaching question, right? Depth versus breadth, you know? Um, when I was teaching, what I did was I had a textbook that I almost never used in class. And I felt like a bunch of my co, the people who were teaching with me, a bunch of my colleagues, maybe you, even though they didn't assign the textbook readings, use the textbook readings as the outline for the class that they would give. Like, oh, I see in the textbook in this section, there are these five topics covered. So I'm, that's what I'm going to cover on Monday is these five things. And what I felt like that did was that meant for my students that they could either attend a class or read, but they didn't need to do both. If we if those things were mirrors of each other, if my class was a mirror of the chapter textbook, um, if you understand what I'm saying here. So what I did is first I tried to emphasize the textbook in my in my course. I assigned readings out of there and then I used and again, this was an in person class. I used the quizzes that came with the textbook. So every day they would come in, they would have a reading quiz. I made it a very small percent of their grade, 10% on the reading quiz. But, you know, you mentioned the students are grade motivated because it was worth points. It helped them do that. And that was my breath, right? That made sure that all the topics were covered because the textbook covered them and my reading quizzes covered them. But then when I thought about how I wanted to spend my class time, what I said to myself is, what do I want these students to remember two years from now, three years from now? So if you're te teaching those that freshman introductory class, that is one of those ones that you have that huge stress on that you've got to do the breadth of it. What do I want those students to remember when I see them in a higher level class? What's the big takeaway that if they forget it, you know, it's 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 going to be, you know, you know, you, you, they're going to really struggle later on. What's the thing that they're going to need to remember in their careers? And 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 that's how I did it. I used I used 
pre-made things and things like things that came along with the textbook to help make sure I hit the breath. And then I just, because it does take more time and I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't, but I'd focused my time on the things that I thought were really, really important. And I tried not to just, because the whole point of this active learning session is just because I said it in front of the class doesn't mean the students learned it. Right. And sometimes like I remember, I, you know, I said right, right at the beginning, Getting, like the students have this preference towards passive learning sometimes where they would prefer yes just tell me exactly what's important and please tell me what's on the quiz and yes I will raise my hand and ask you if it's going to be on the quiz you know that that you know that's the mindset they're in so to break out of that that's that, that's what I did what do you do Rian when you try to when you try to say like what's really important what what's worth spending class time on I, well, that's exactly it. And for me, I did some rewriting when I took a studio art class and put it online. I had to go in. I can't show you things in person in the studio. So what are the biggest things I want you to walk away with? And so I went back to those sort of, I mean, they're student learning outcomes and you'd really don't want more than two or three max in a class. And I wanted students to be able to problem solve. I wanted them to be able to make something and say, is this working for me? And if it isn't, is it a technical issue? Is it a design issue? Is it a conceptual issue? Is one not supporting the other? Okay, that's my issue. Now, how do I go about trying again? So I wanted to, them to develop that tenacity. I wanted them to be able to ask themselves questions. That was more important for me than getting prints that would absolutely get juried into the student show. And you know what? I got prints that were gonna get juried into the student show because they were like, all right, this didn't work. And I figured out it didn't work here because I didn't have a good composition and I needed to change the value contrast and I changed the top, you know, like they were there in there because I kept coming back to what's the most important thing. Now, do all of them exactly know how much ink to put on the block? No. But that you that we'll figure that out later. You know, that's not as important as the tenacity to ask the questions and figure out some responses. The other thing I wanted to add is that, you know, students come in and they have certain learning habits that they like Ed said from high school and it is very passive. And in college, we have to because of the amount of information we're covering, have them be way more engaged if they're going to cover it. Like it's just, it's going to have to happen. One of the uh, professional learning communities we're going to be doing this fall is uh, teach students how to learn. And it was actually written by a chemistry professor. And her purpose was to give faculty some tools to give students some skills that will help them learn. And it will take very little class time because she's like, oh my God, I have so much material I need them to cover. I can't take a month and teach them how to study. I need you to like learn this while you're learning the material. And it's a really good book and we will be um, working through it uh, this fall. So those are two things that I've got to add. Yeah, thanks, that sounds great. Uh, helping students how to learn. I mean, I, I still, you know, honestly, I still struggled how to learn myself. <laughs> it is a process. It is a process. <laughs> Absolutely. So are there other questions? We've given you the handout, so you've got something to refer to. Ed and I, our emails are available if you've got other questions. The PLC will be happening this fall. What else can we do for you while we've got a few minutes? So are we, are we good? Was this helpful? How do we make sure that you've got what you need? For me, it was very inspiring. I will, uh, I took notes and I read the document and think about it. But yeah, that was very, very good. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, 
I took the time. It was very, very instructive. Yeah, I like it. I think I, I will suggest as we have new faculty and they have a lot of experience, but I will suggest them to attend those meetings, especially during summer. It's great you giving us the opportunity to do that during the summer, because as you know, during the semester, my brain is just overloaded. So. Oh my goodness! Everybody's I totally got their understand. own preferences on that. You know, some people want it during the semester because that's that's when they're in the mode. So they want it. They want you know oh, yeah. moment during the semester. Some people like to just focus and compartmentalize, compartmentalize their time and say during the semester I need to do semester things and then give me some opportunities during the quote off season. Though I don't think you, I don't think you faculty ever have an off season. So we'll we'll use that lightly. Um, <laughs> Uh, but right you know, when you're teaching and when you're not teaching. So yeah, you want that's, that's to focus on better. developing Thanks your yeah. course when you're not teaching, not trying to do it at the same time. It's like, you know, building the plane when you're flying it. Be nice to think about it while it's on the ground. Yeah. Is, the other thing I want to do is, um, you know, I, I, I went to this great talk that was by the Binghamton University Chemistry Department. And actually we did, that was what our first session was on this morning. They rewrote their entire introductory chemistry to be project-based and student group projects. Mm. And um, huge classes, huge classes. Yeah. They did it. You know, 500 it. students, 450 students. They specifically, their chemistry for engineers mm -hmm. and their chemistry for pre-med because those were different sections they redid um, with uh, kind of a project and group project mentality through the whole thing. And I think it's easy to talk in abstract, but like I'll see if I can see who did that um, webinar, if you're interested, oh, yeah. um, and connect you to them, because it's another SUNY um, school that's doing some really interesting things only an hour away. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you get to talk to people who are doing really cool stuff, in your discipline that it makes it easier to conceptualize, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, that sounds good. This summer, my project is uh, I have three students for research, but uh, like this this year, this online thing made me realize how bad instructor I am and I need to work on it. I don't say bad in terms of uh, it, uh, I'm, I don't have hard feeling about it, but I mean, I realize I'm, I could do better. And uh, and then uh, I knew I suspected that when we were doing face to face, but face to face, you see the students and I'm a very enthusiastic person. So through my energy and my enthusiasm, the student kind of engage. But then I, I lost that and now I was talking to a screen and that was purely instructing. And then I'm realizing, oh, wow, I, I'm not. I, yeah, I need to work on it. <laughs> well, so that's kind of my objective because of what happened this last year this 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 last year was the toughest thing anybody who's taught has ever done yeah this was, this was a rough year absolutely janet what you got did i understand ed to say that there are lectures in different disciplines that we could watch you were talking about the chemistry no it was, it was just a um they came to the suny oer leads meeting because they were using oer as they did all of this um, transformation. Um, and so I was going to see if I could pull up the the recording. Um, it just happened that, you know, there was one in chemistry that 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 I thought was really, really interesting. Yeah, I'd love to uh, if you could like send a notice that I'd love to see that, too. Uh, my problem has always <laughs> one of my problems has always been that I'm dealing with um, a topic that is intensely factual and there are, there's new vocabulary and new facts. And we also have, um, you know, projects that where they have to do things. You have to write a case brief or you have to write a deal memo. But still, almost everything is <clears throat> something new. So it's hard to get around the lecture. I don't see how students can teach each other about copyright law. So if somebody else had got that figured out, I'd love to watch it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was um, a really interesting, it was a great session and it, this what was presented this morning was about um, an aspect to that, but they started using uh, Collaboration U, which is uh, a short open educational resources course to teach students and have them learn how to collaborate and how much it changed 
how they could do the projects and then how they learned the material. It was really yeah. pretty inspiring. So that my, my question remains the same. I don't understand how teachers, how students can teach each other about the copyright law just mm -hmm. by looking at the law. So I would love to see something where somebody started out with something very fact driven mm -hmm. and, and how students could collaborate to do that. Thank you. Absolutely. So yeah, we, um, we've, we've got that access to that course, um, the collaborative course, the little mini course uh, will be coming soon. Okay, great. We have access now. Super. Hey, I'm glad that with uh, the small group, we were able to make this just a little, a little less formal and just kind of talk to each other about teaching. It's my favorite conversation to have. So it was really good to see you guys this afternoon. Very good to see you. Yeah, Very good. Everybody. Bye. Thanks for giving your time. Bye-bye.